Hello everyone and welcome to EduCert Small Talk series where we discuss some key topics related to common medical and surgical practice. So today's video is going to be the final part of our nutrition basics series. Uh, in the first, we discussed how to apply nutrition orders in the rounds practically. In the second part, we saw some cases of colorectal surgery and enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, nutrition-wise. And today, we are going to discuss predominantly on the need of parenteral nutrition in these cases and complications that can arise due to administration of enteral or parenteral nutrition. As always, we are going to discuss these points along with two clinically managed cases by our team. So I am sure all of you know this slide by now that whenever you see a patient who seems to have problems with the gastrointestinal tract or a patient who is malnourished, there is a checklist that should pop up in your mind. First is, does the patient need nutrition? So the indication of nutritional support in your patient the root, as long as the gut is functional, we prefer enteral, if not parenteral. For what formulas to give or what fluids to give based on whether you are selecting enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition. We have already seen different access routes in the previous videos. I will put links in the description. So if you have not, you can see part one and two. Requirement of the patient, the calculation has been shown in video one and timing. So these are the key points. If you answer all these questions for each patient, your nutritional order will be ready and you will be practically able to administer nutrition appropriately in your patient. So today's first case is a 78-year-old female who had acute severe pain in the abdomen for duration of around 12 hours with abdominal distension. She has a history of aortic valve replacement 25 years back and is on warfarin. On examination, there is tachycardia and tachypnea, there is diffuse tenderness and absent bowel sounds. So the arrows pointed bowel wall edema, pneumatosis intestinalis, and in this sagittal section, you can appreciate that the superior mesenteric vessels are blocked. So this patient needed an urgent exploratory laparotomy and required a removal of almost the entire superior mesenteric territory. So that is an extensive small bowel resection and she will end up with a short gut syndrome. Because this was an emergency surgery, we did an endostoma and this stoma was closed at three weeks. So now what are the indications for nutritional support in this patient? Definitely, she is going to be unable to eat for more than five days or at least her oral intake is not going to maintain her 50% of daily requirement for more than seven days. This is because she does not have majority of her small bowel which absorbs most of the nutrition. So she is at severe nutritional risk. So coming to Nutritional management of short gut syndrome, even in these patients, enteral nutrition should be continued. You supplement these patients with antacids, anti-motility agents, octreotide, growth hormone, and other medical measures to try and improve the gut absorption of nutrients in these cases. And enteral nutrition has to be attempted. However, at 78 with such an extensive surgery, this patient required parenteral nutrition and she probably would need it for a long time, even at home. Now, when you give parenteral nutrition, you have to also give supplements for essential micronutrients. And the most important point in this patient is to maintain a calorie chart or a diet diary, as it is commonly known in words. Parenteral nutrition is to be given only when there is contraindication to enteral nutrition or when enteral nutrition cannot fulfill the needs of the patient. So if the patient cannot tolerate enteral nutrition, there may be intractable vomiting or diarrhea or there may be intestinal obstruction or ileus, there may be high output intestinal fistula. These are the conditions where the nutrients will not be absorbed enterally. And these patients may need total parenteral nutrition or supportive parenteral nutrition.
Hemodynamic instability is one condition where enteral nutrition may not be feasible. So these are the cases where parenteral nutrition will be required. Another important point that was there in our patient is intestinal ischemia. Diffuse peritonitis, again, the bowel will go into ileus and so enteral nutrition may not be feasible. Severe gastrointestinal hemorrhages lead to hemodynamic instability and therefore these patients may not be able to tolerate enteral nutrition. Malabsorption patients, again, will need parenteral nutrition. So some key points when you are considering your patient for parenteral nutrition is most important point is that you have to give parenteral nutrition only when it is going to be required for more than five to seven days minimum. You can't give one or two bags of TPN and say we have given parenteral nutrition because that is not going to help the patient. Very important is to correct the fluid electrolyte and acid base imbalance. So the patient should be well hydrated electrolyte level should be normal because parenteral nutrition can lead to electrolyte abnormalities and acid base imbalance should also be taken care of. Baseline tests, even in the last video we saw that we need some baseline tests for starting nutritional therapy. So liver function test, electrolyte creatinine, sugar levels and weight of the patient is to be assessed. Once you have started parenteral nutrition, the daily monitoring initially for the first 72 hours require electrolytes, especially phosphate levels. We will see why complete blood count, urea creatinine and weight of the patient. Liver function test should be performed twice weekly. When you start parenteral nutrition, there may be hyperglycemia and insulin can be given separately from the parenteral nutrition bag as infusion or on sliding scale as per six hour glucose determination. All these things are to be done in the first week. Once the parameters have settled on the fixed rate of nutrition, the monitoring can be less intense. So parenteral nutrition access can be peripheral or central. As we all know, the central parenteral nutrition Fluids are high osmolar and high calorie dense. Generally, parenteral nutrition can be given using neckline or peripheral inserted central catheter. So these are two ways of giving centrally or you can give using peripheral line. Now coming to a very interesting point before going on to complications is this case two, who is a 72 year old male with abdominal pain Amylase and lipase normal, ultrasound showed a mass in the head of pancreas and CA199 was 2700. So this patient had a mass in the head of pancreas which required vascular reconstruction. See, patient was given neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy and then after downstaging, the patient was planned for a Whipple procedure with venous and common hepatic artery replaced reconstruction. How is this case important in this video? Now, there are two points, pre-operative and post-operative. So pre-operative planning, when we do these kind of extensive procedures, involves putting in a feeding tube. Now, this feeding tube can be a feeding jejunostomy or a nasojejunal tube. However, when we are planning venous and arterial reconstructions in a patient who has already received chemotherapy and radiotherapy, we anticipate complications and long-term requirement of enteral nutritional access. That is why this patient was planned for a feeding jejunostomy. Patient was doing well till post-operative day six when this drain started coming once the patient was started orally on diet. So I'll give you 10 seconds to think of what this complication is of a Whipple procedure with venous and arterial reconstruction. This is a very characteristic drain image and a spot clinical diagnosis is a chyle leak, right? Due to extensive dissection around the arteries, there can be lymphatic leak and this is a chyle leak. So these patients need medium chain triglyceride diet. Again, the nutrition in these cases is enteral and there are medium chain triglyceride powders as well as oils available. Coconut oil is a very 
cost effective medium chain triglyceride oil and mct powders are also available remember that when you use medium chain triglyceride powder is it already has a protein content no milk is advised because milk contains non medium chain triglyceride lipids as well right so this patient was started on this mct diet with enteral nutrition and resolved at 10 to 12 days of this support so now coming on to complications of nutrition now we have divided these into two parts one is excess related complication and the other is the metabolic complications right so excess related complications like i said you can have cardiac dysrhythmias procedure related complications include pneumothorax perforation of the excess vein such as igv perforation and hemothorax any external place catheter is prone to infection or block right so you can have catheter line infection or catheter thrombosis and block which can also lead to infective endocarditis a very rare complication but a noted complication if there is an inadvertent arterial puncture there can be arterial pseudo aneurysm in some cases there can be now or lymphatic injury during excess another rare complication is air embolism for any procedure that opens the neck veins right so these are excess related complications with parenteral nutrition coming to enteral nutrition we are making a hole in the gut if it is not sealed properly or if there is a kink in the gut at the site of fixation of the tube to the entire abdominal wall it can lead to small bowel necrosis pneumatosis intestinalis now in cases with feeding jejunostomy excess or feeding gastrostomy excess pneumatosis intestinalis can be benign or can be a feature of small bowel necrosis so to rule out this two possibilities before taking the patient for surgery there can be tube displacement tube blockage tube malposition which can be due to surgical problems or due to peristalsis and you can have intestinal perforation and infection infections are rare with enteral tubes but there can be skin site infections infections are more common with parenteral nutrition so that is excess related complications the second part is metabolic complications and as i told before hyperglycemia is very common because the body takes time to adapt to this sudden intake of nutrition sometimes there can also be hypoglycemia and hypertriglyceridemia right there can be azotemia and there can be osteoporosis in trace metal deficiency this is a very commonly asked question that zinc deficiency is the most common trace metal deficiency and that is why zinc and glutamine supplements are now available separately when your patients are on enteral and parenteral nutrition there can also be liver dysfunction fatty infiltration steatosis and in the long term there can be gallstone formation one of the very important entity that you need to mention in your exams and that you need to remember is refeeding syndrome okay this is very important to identify in clinical practice also because it's very rarely seen but when seen it can lead to very varied presentations in your patient and the treatment is very simple just reducing the rate of nutrition so identification of refeeding syndrome is very important at risk population is patients we who are severely malnourished when you start nutritional supplementation patients with increased unintentional weight loss and very low nutrient intake in past right in these patients when you reinstitute the feeding at a very rapid rate what happens is that body starts secreting a lot of hormones to help in the digestion especially insulin and because of this the metabolic processes that need electrolytes lead to internalization of potassium phosphorus and magnesium in the cells leading to serum abnormalities of hypokalemia hypophosphatemia and hypomagnesemia can lead to congestive cardiac failure cardiac arrhythmias and unfortunate sudden death of the patient so it is very important to identify refeeding syndrome in the patients and 
institute correction of electrolyte abnormalities and reduce the rate of nutritional supplementation. So to conclude our nutrition basics series in three video parts, the diet orders are the most important orders because the patients predominantly need nutrition. Use gut whenever possible. And that is why we have discussed on parenteral nutrition very briefly. Most of the focus has been on enteral nutrition because that is what is used most commonly. Parental nutrition needs to be given for a minimum of seven days. So if you are giving parental nutrition for three days, you are actually harming the patient and not helping. Refeeding syndrome should be prevented at all costs. This is very important because it, it would be unfortunate that you consider nutritional support appropriately, but use it overzealously. Management of excess device is important to prevent infection, thrombosis, blockages, and so on and so forth. Thank you.